We say thank you. We thank you, God, for being good. Hey, we thank you, God, for being great. We thank you for being great in our lives. Now, as we continue in worship, we pray that as your word goes forth, it would go forth with, with power, with clarity, and with the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. This is our prayer, and we lift it in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And the people of God said together, amen. Our brothers and our sisters, the scripture has already been read in our hearing. However, please allow me to lift up just a few verses coming to us from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11, beginning at the 25th verse. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. And brothers and sisters, for the next few minutes, the topic of our teaching shall be a continuation of our series on the five practices of a fruitful congregation. And we're focusing on radical hospitality. And today's message, if we were to give it a title, would be like a good neighbor. Like a good neighbor. I, I don't bother anyone, y'all. I, I mean, I seriously do mind my own business and take care of my family, and I try to stay out of trouble, and there's always trouble around, but I do the best in minding my own business. Yeah, I take care of my family, and I do what I have to do, and it's not easy, but I make sure that my wife and my children are well provided for, and we don't have what we used to have, you see, because before the 2008 economic downturn, I was making six figures, but then I was let go. I was let go, and I couldn't find a job. I called all my friends, and there were no leads, and it led from one year to the next year, and I got a job teaching as a substitute teacher for a while just to help to make some ends meet and after that couldn't pay all of the bills I had to start driving for Uber and after driving for Uber in the evenings and on the weekends and substitute teaching during the day you would think I might have enough but nah it still wasn't enough until one day my wife came to me in the home that we had lived in in the home that my parents had lived in and the home that my grandparents had built she said well we probably need to sell this house I said no 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 you see because granddaddy worked too hard to pass this down from one generation to the next generation and I'm I'm just not going to let it go but she said look around us this neighborhood is changing there are fewer and fewer people that look like us every month somebody's knocking on the door to ask if this house is for sale or that they would be willing to buy it but you see I don't want to sell it when I think of the blood and sweat and tears of generations of my family that went in to build this house heck nah 
I mean, I'm not going to allow them to come here and tear it down and build up this huge monstrosity just so they could be a little closer to downtown. No, it's not going down like that. And so after talking with my wife, she said the house was large enough now that our oldest child had moved out that we could rent out some rooms. I said, no, I'm not running no rooming house. She said, no, it's not like that. She introduced me to this app, this 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 new business called Airbnb where we can rent out rooms in our own house and I didn't want to think about it but the truth was y'all we needed to do something because I knew the next tax bill was coming soon so even though it broke my heart I, I followed my wife's instructions and we began to spruce up and we put some gently used furniture into those rooms that we were deciding that we were going to rent out and then we took pictures and posted them online and brothers and sisters it did not feel good to know that the space in which my grandmother and grandparents had slept was now going to be opened up to anybody and everybody who was coming to town for a football game or something like that but you see I had to do what well, y'all I mind my own business and all I want to do is take care of my family and it's been okay. It wasn't as bad as I thought it once was. Only challenge is some of the guests, they want to bring their dogs. I don't know why people travel with their dogs nowadays. I don't know why that's a thing, but they bring their dogs into our home and they talk about how convenient it is. And most of the people have been nice. Most of the people have been genuinely kind. But, but you see, the other day there was something that blew my mind because late one night, we had a knock on the door and you know, I wasn't expecting anybody. I asked my wife, did she have somebody reserve the rooms? And she said, no. Nah. And so, brothers and sisters, I gotta be honest that I, I do carry a weapon. And so I made sure my, my piece was in my pocket as I went to the door. I said, who is it? And it was the voice of somebody I didn't recognize. And I peeked through the peephole and as I looked, I, I saw this face. And you see, I'm not, let me, I'm not racist. I don't consider myself a bigot. You see, because my family has had to endure racism for years, but every now and again when I see somebody, I get a strange feeling. And so I opened the door and there was this brother and I could tell that English was not his first language. And I'm like, yo, what is it that you want? Why are you knocking on my door this late at night? He then said he knew that this was a place where people could stay, that he saw it on Airbnb, but something was going on with his phone. And there was something in me that said, no, no, if, if you have not reserved and registered, you're not coming through the doors of this house. But then I felt the Holy Spirit tap me on the shoulder and say, just hear him out. So I stood there listening to this brother in his broken English try to describe the fact that something had happened and I looked at him and he looked like he was all right even though he was one of them foreigners, you know, and I still had my piece close enough to me in case he tried to do anything. And then he began to talk and he wanted me to come outside and I took one step and I said, no, nah, no, nah. but then that same Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder again and said, it's gonna be all right. So I walked down the front steps and as I walked toward his car, cautiously, I saw him open the door and then there was another brother who was bandaged, who looked like he had been beaten within an inch of his life. I said, nah, you, you, you all need to call the police. You all need to go down to University Hospital or something. I, I don't want any parts of that. He says, no, 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 he's okay, he's, he's okay. In his broken English, he just needs some place to sleep. And I said, no, 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 but at the same time, I felt that tap on my shoulder again. And, and brothers and sisters, my late grandmother used to always tell me, when you feel that, it's not a coincidence, but maybe the Lord is whispering to you. But I didn't know how I was going to explain it to my wife, how we're going to bring this brother who, who is beaten and broken and bloodied and bandaged. We're going to bring him into our place and our space. And this brother who doesn't speak English all that well, He's going to be the one who brings him into our home. But before I knew it, I was helping that brother out of the car and into our house, just shaking my head, wondering how I was going to explain it to my wife. But as we made our way into the home, she was already standing there as if she knew what was going on. And she simply said, I'll get the room ready. And I'm thinking, how are we going to handle this? This brother can barely walk up the stairs. He, he really needs a hospital. But that same thing was tapping me on the shoulder. And I said, yeah, 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 I get it. It's going to be all right. 
and he stayed with us a night. And to be honest with you, I wasn't even expecting any money, but the same brother with the broken English who couldn't speak well from the foreign place, he reached in his pocket the next day and pulled out a wad this thick. I said, that brother must be selling drugs or doing something illegal because nobody needs to have that amount of cash. And he gave me money to take care of him. And he said, if there's anything else he needs, don't worry, I've got more money where this comes from and I'll make sure everything is going to be all right. As I was talking to the brother who was getting stronger every day, I mean the first day he was in some bad shape, y'all, but the next day he told me exactly what happened, that he was leaving Detroit and he was coming toward this part of the state and he had been in a particular place where they had held him up. Not only did they hold him up, but they pistol whipped him and not only did they whip him, but they took his car and everything he had. And the thing about it, brothers and sisters, he said while he was there in that place broken and bruised, there came by a brother in this big, long Cadillac. And he recognized him because he was the preacher from the Baptist church right now in the next town. And the preacher looked at him. He said, preacher, preacher, I recognize you. Can you help me out? He said, no, no, I'm sorry. I've got a convention I'm going to, but I'm going to pray for you. Not only did the preacher walk past him, but a couple of minutes later, there was this, this deacon, well-suited and well-dressed. And he said, brother, I, I can tell that you go to church, and maybe the Lord will touch your heart to give me something. He said, God blesses those who got their own. And he walked on by. And it wasn't until that foreigner came that saw me in the situation that I was, this is him telling the story, that he picked me up and brought me here. And it was because that foreigner demonstrated love that those other two did not, that I am alive today. Well, brothers and sisters, as I'm sharing with you this morning, this is a story of my own imagination, amen but it's based in the word of God as we see it today, the word of God which comes to us from the Gospel of Luke that tells a story of the Good Samaritan. And yes, this is a 21st century contextualized version of the Good Samaritan, but it's right there in the text that there was a person who was an innkeeper who opens his home to a brother who brings another brother who is broken and bruised. And the one who has brought him is a foreigner. The word says that it was a Samaritan. And when you understand the context of the scriptures and what we see in biblical times, Samaritans were the foreigners. They were the outsiders. They were the half kind of sort of step cousins of the Jews and they were a little bit different. They talked different. They walked different. They believed a little bit differently. They were cliquish and they were clannish. You didn't expect foreigners to extend themselves out to others and others certainly didn't extend themselves out to these Samaritans. But brothers and sisters in this passage of scripture as Jesus is telling us how we live in this world he says we have got to be not like the preacher or the deacon but we've got to be like the Samaritan, the foreigner who opens up his heart and opens up his hands to be a blessing to someone else. As we continue in this series known as the five practices of a fruitful congregation, the very first practice that Robert Shinese says is what sets congregations and the people within those congregations above and apart from everyone else is their ability to engage in radical hospitality. And that's what we see in this text today, and that's what God desires for each and every one of us. Because if this congregation is going to continue to thrive and to grow, then we must be engaged in the work of fruitful ministry. And what is fruitful ministry? Fruitful ministry is ministry that helps us to be able to glorify God, not simply here on Sunday morning. Because the thing about it is, it's good, easy to look good on Sunday morning. And y'all look good. Y'all look real good. I mean, all, a whole lot of red out there today. Y'all look good in every color that you're wearing this morning. But the challenge is we've not only had to look good in here, but we've got to be able to look good out there. Because the truth of the matter is that churches across this nation and around this world are 
dying and those that aren't dying are shrinking, that this is not the church of 50 years ago or 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. But in order for us to be the people that God wants us to be, we can't always get stuck in looking in the past of how it used to be. Yes, we celebrate our past. We call the names of our ancestors. We revere our history. But that's simply a foundation for us to go to do that which God desires and needs and calls us to do. And brothers and sisters, that call and that need doesn't exist here at 900 John A. Woods as much as it exists down the street, around the corner, across town, in another county, or even someplace else in this world. That the purpose of the body of Christ isn't simply to be a hospital that meets the needs of those who are hurting. Yes, there is healing that is made available in this place. There is wholeness that is made available in this place. But the purpose of the body of Christ is to equip the saints for ministry. The purpose of the body of Christ is to teach us how to take the love of God in here and take it out there. And brothers and sisters, in the words of Cornell West, what does love look like in public? It looks like justice. It looks like power. It looks like peace. And in order for us to experience that out there, we need to be able to learn how to do it in here. And in order to learn, we have to lean on the word of God. And in this word of God, we see that the brother who is most like the neighbor, the good neighbor, is the person that you at least expect. And I believe one of the first lessons that we learn from this passage of scripture is that sometimes God's miracles come in places where we least expect them. I mean, there are those of us who are, who are recipients of miracles. Is there anybody here that God has wrought some miracles in your life? Now, is there anybody here that God has made some ways in your life? Is there anybody here for whom God has been a way maker and a promise keeper and a light in the darkness? Yes, we've got those witnesses right here in this place. And brothers and sisters, as we praise God for the ways he has made and the miracles he has wrought, one of the things that makes it a miracle is because it came at an unexpected time. I mean, for those of us who have ever been in some dark and some hard places, you can testify to the fact that God came in in the nick of time. I mean, our ancestors used to say that he may not always come when you want him, but God is right on time. Is there anybody here that knows that God is an on-time God? Is there anybody here that knows that God will show up when you least expect it? That God will use some people you don't understand, some people you just don't know, some people you plain just don't like, and that God will indeed use that person to bless you. That way you've got to turn around and say, it wasn't nobody but the Lord. Now, I know that's not good English, but that's good theology. If it wasn't nobody but the Lord, why don't you put your hands together and give God praise? If you know it wasn't nobody but but God, why don't you begin to open up your mouth and bless his name? If God has made some ways and God has wrought some miracles, throw your head back and say, yeah! I mean, there are some of us who are alive today because God blessed us in some unexpected ways, at some unexpected times, and through some unexpected individuals. But that's just the way God works. God is able to show up and show out wherever God wants to do, wherever God wants to do, whenever God wants to do it. And you see, this brother would have probably least expected his healing to come from the Samaritan. But you see, because he was able and willing to receive the unexpected blessings of God, he was able to receive the healing that he needs. And that's true for all of us. And brothers and sisters, when we tie that into what that looks like in the context of radical hospitality, it means we have to be willing to do the unexpected. That, that tap on the shoulder that I was talking about in the story, there are times that God speaks to us. And you know what we do? <laughs> the 
But that's what prayer does. It teaches you how to hear the voice of God. That's what worship does. It makes you familiar with the presence of God so that when you hear that voice and when you feel that nudge that you know it's not just a coincidence and it's not just guilt, but rather it's the Lord that is moving on your heart. The first lesson we learn is to expect the unexpected. Then what we see, brothers and sisters, is that the good Samaritan is willing and able to give of his own resources. He gives of his own resources in the terms of the oil and wine he uses to anoint and heal the brother, not simply an anointing for holy purposes, but an anointing for healing. And that's one of the things that oil and wine were used for. The oil was a salve, and the wine was used as a disinfectant for his bruises. And he bandaged him up, and he put him on his own saddle. I mean, it's one thing to give the brother some money in order to go to the health care center to get the needs he has met, but the brother puts him on his own saddle, puts him on his own beast of burden, that he is willing to give of himself, and he is willing to sacrifice, and he is willing to take the less comfortable position in order for somebody else to be blessed. Now that's what hospitality, radical hospitality looks like. It's one thing when you are blessed and you share the blessing that you have. It's a totally different thing when you give up your blessing for somebody else to be blessed. Now for those of you who know me well, you know that I love to eat. You, I didn't get this size by, you, you know, I, I love to eat. And I'll give my children anything, but it always happens to be when I'm enjoying something that I enjoy that one of my children will come up to me and say, Daddy, can I have some of what you're having? And there are times, and I'm a preacher, y'all, so I got to be careful what I say in the congregation and in the pulpit and to my children. But there are times I'm like, can't I have nothing to myself? Since they're down in children's church, can I, can I confess? And the 300 of y'all are just keeping a secret? There are times that I wait for my kids to go to bed and before... <laughs> I get to enjoy what I want to enjoy. Is there a witness in the house today? Amen. It's one thing when you have more than enough to share. But it's different when you have to sacrifice. When there's only one serving of ice cream left. When there's only one serving of your favorite beverage that's left in the refrigerator, when there's only one of, are you willing to give in order to make certain that somebody else has? And I mean, that's what sacrifice means, brothers and sisters, but when we consider who God is and how much God has given to us, that we should be able to give to others because the truth of the matter is that the blessings that God bestows upon us we're not reservoirs to hold that blessing, but rather we are conduits that blessing flow through us that somebody else might be blessed. And the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, that there are those of us who are here today. If we were to be honest, the reasons that we're here is not because we've always had it together. The reasons that we're here is not because we always worked so hard. The reason that some of us are sitting in these pews and living the lives and the type of life that we are able to enjoy is because somebody else sacrificed on our behalf. I mean, there's somebody who's here today. There's somebody who's here today. That big mama may not have been able to go to school, but guess what? She worked hard in order for you to have a blessing that she didn't have. Somebody's mother or father here went without and wore some of the same clothes and some of the same shoes year after year after year. Daddy never bought that new car because he wanted to make sure that you had enough of what you needed in order for you to get from point A to point B. I'm just wondering, is there anyone here who is transparent enough to be able to say, you see, I didn't get here by myself, but but you see somebody else was able to help somebody else was able to make some sacrifices somebody else went without so that I can have when I look back over the long stretch of years when I consider all that my parents and grandparents have gone through that there was a time in my family's life when they picked cotton from sun up to sundown but it wasn't simply to put food on the table but that somebody else might be blessed that the children's children might be blessed that 
the children's children's children might be blessed is there anybody here that you know that you didn't get here by yourself but because somebody else sacrificed somebody else made a way somebody else opened up a door somebody else decided to step back so that you could step through yes somebody made some sacrifice And the final lesson that we see in radical hospitality that this brother exhibits, it would be well and good for him to check on the needs of somebody, but he, he didn't do the, just that. It would be well and good for him to get him to a place of help, but he didn't do just that. But what I love about this passage of scripture, that after he spends a night caring for the brother who is bruised and broken, he says, I got to go on my way, but I'm going to put something down on it. I'm sorry, that was my Newark vernacular. I'm going to make sure that he has enough to take care of him for the next couple of days. That the radical hospitality that he exhibits is that he was willing to pay it forward for this brother. That this brother might be healed. Now, some of us we would have thought ourselves to be righteous if we at least checked on the brother to make sure he wasn't dead when he was laying in the alley. Others of us who are showed enough sanctified, we might have given the brother a couple of dollars. Those really saved folks might have taken him to get some help someplace. But you see, this brother was willing to able to pay it forward on somebody else's behalf. And I'm so glad that we see that in this passage of scripture. But you see, if it had never been mentioned in the gospel of Luke, I'm so glad that the person who was telling the story wasn't simply a teacher or a storyteller. But you see, Jesus is responding of what justice and righteousness looks like, what love in public looks like. And Jesus is able to share this parable. And you know what a parable is. It is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That he shares this parable in order to tell others that there are sometimes you've got to pay it forward for somebody else. Yes, we all all celebrated when it was about people who sacrificed for us but brothers and sisters that's not where the celebration stops that the real life of faith means when we are willing to sacrifice and pay it forward for somebody else yes not only for somebody else but for people who don't always have it all together mm. you see it's easy to get behind somebody with some potential yeah, it's easy to, to support somebody who, who's got it together. It's easy to give a scholarship to the straight A student who's involved in 10 curricular, extracurricular activities. It's easy to celebrate somebody graduating from high school when they've done everything right. But brothers and sisters, what about those folks who don't have it all together? What about the folks who've got some history? Let me talk to this side of the congregation. Maybe. I love y'all too. I want to talk to everybody. I felt that chilly wind come from this side when I said that. But part of our life of faith is being able to look past what we see. To look past the blood and the scars and the bruises. Because the Bible never says that the man who offered help asked him, well, how did you get in that situation? Right, right, right. The Bible never says the man who offered help said, well, I'll help you out as long as you pay me back and sign this IOU. The Bible never says that the man who offered help said, as long as you get yourself together and come to church on Sunday morning, I'll be willing to help you. You see, the help was given. It was just simply given even when the brother was in his worst position. It was given when there was no promise of ever being paid back. It was given when there was no guarantee that the brother would get his life together. It was given with no understanding of what the brother's criminal history might have been, why he was on that road to Jericho in the first place. But you see, the same person who is telling the story has a good track record and paying it forward for somebody else. Because the Bible says that not while we were at our best, but while we were 
were yet sinners. That's when Jesus came to die for us. Yes, the person who is telling the story, the teacher, the rabbi, the prophet, the teller is a person who is able to pay it forward for somebody else. And when I consider all that God has done, not necessarily for that sinner who was on his way from Jericho to Jerusalem, but when I consider what he did for me, that he was willing to die in order to pay it forward for me. Because brothers and sisters, yes, I'm a pastor and I'm a preacher, but I've got a past just like everybody else. Yeah, you got some skeletons in your closet too. Yeah, you've been through some places before that you're not proud of, but you see, it was God, God's self who decided to pay it forward that over 2,000 years ago that God was able to look through the annals of time and he saw a person by the name of Mashad Evans and church I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within seeking to rise no more but the master of the sea he heard, 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 heard my despairing cry and from the waters from the waters, from the waters, from the waters, he lifted me. Now safe am I. It wasn't my education. It wasn't my good looks. It wasn't my reputation. But it was the love of God that lifted me. Now safe, 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 safe am I. Yeah. As we stand, as we stand all over the congregation, the late great poet Robert Frost once penned a poem that said, good fences make good neighbors. You stay on your side, I'll stay on my side, and we're good. But no, that's not what a good neighbor looks like. In the body of Christ, it's not the fence, but the bridge. And particularly in this day and age. Do y'all remember a time when you knew the person who lived next to you on this side and next? You knew everybody on that block. We live in a different world. And so what being a neighbor looks like requires a bit more. My brother, my sister, if you're here today and you feel like that brother who has been beaten up and broken and left by the side of the road, that sister who has been left behind. I want to introduce you to a good neighbor. And his name is Jesus. Not State Farm, not all state, not God, Jesus. You see, because State Farm will offer insurance, but Jesus offers a blessed assurance that we can have exactly what we need to make it through this life. And when this life is over, to have life eternal with God in heaven in the next. If you're here today and you need a good friend, a good neighbor, someone who you can connect with and who can connect with you, brothers and sisters, I offer you Jesus today. I'm not asking you to live a perfect life. I'm not asking your history or your past, but I'm just simply asking, will you take a step toward the Lord? If you're here today and have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the opportunity is yours and the time is now. Won't you please come to make your way down this altar, to this altar, to give me your hand and to give God your heart. Is there one today? Wherever you are, won't you come? Come on, come on, come on, come on. If you need a new chance, a new start, God can do what you can't do for yourself. And my brother, my sister, if you're here today and you need a new church home, don't wait, don't hesitate, but come connect with this family of faith. I would love to be your pastor and we would love to be your church family. Let us surround you with love and open arms. Is there one today? Won't you come?